would suffer defeat as the blackness of night closed off the light. My heart sank with fear. My desperate cry rang out with fright. All I could see was no hope inside. With faith all but gone, I met the one who came looking for me. To rescue my soul and calm all my fears Now I'm safe from all harm Since I met the one who came looking for me Oh, Satan had already been down my grave His plan had moved forward to put me away I drifted so far, would anyone care?
Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in Take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Lord, sometimes I feel the weight of every trial. So I count the cost and trust you as your child. Saw your crown of thorns, how you gladly wore it. Every cross I bear, I'm stronger for it. Make me tonight um we'll, we'll be more focused tonight on on the christian you know we've been kind of talking about you know the fate of those that, that don't know the lord but tonight we'll kind of address you know the the christian and what what our future is and and it'll kind of seem odd the starting place but we're going to be in luke 14 and we're going to start in 
verse number 15. Y'all, y'all know the story, so uh, we're going to look at a few of the details, and then, then we'll, we'll jump right in. So verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. So I'd stop right there and think, you know, this man, he makes a great supper and he's asked all these people to come. And nowhere in this book, you know, nowhere in these verses does it say that any of those people deserved what he offered. It was unmerited. He's offering this, you know, supper to these people who have done nothing to deserve, you know, his kindness. But he's offered it. And verse 17, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And and I draw your attention that he sent that servant, that servant was obedient. You know, if we call ourselves, you know, children of God, you know, we love the Lord, we're his servant. He was obedient to his master. Verse number 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So just a question. In these three excuses that are given, two of them are dealing with you know, finances and, and property and those sorts of things. So I ask you, you know, do, in our heart of hearts, do we place things and, and, you know, the things that we own, do we place our property, our, our financial well-being above the Lord? Because there's so many people that come to church with honest intentions, with, with hearts that they, they want to know the Lord, but deep down the things that are most important is financial security. And that's the honest truth. And I I can testify, I can tell you, and this isn't about me, this isn't about our family, but I can honestly tell you the goodness of the Lord. There's been times in our lives where, and in our marriage, where I I did not make much money at all. And we, you know, I I look back at numbers, I'm a numbers person, I'm a math person, and it does not make sense. You know, we, we just trusted that the Lord, you know, would take care. And, and we, we never was late on a payment. We paid for children, you know, to eat. We, we paid for bus children to have food. We, we did everything that we did. And God somehow, you know, I look back and there's no way. We never even got close, you know. God's so good. And, and, and that financial security, if that's our number one concern, it's going to be a wedge between us and the Lord. And that, that's the case with these two men. You know, their property and the things that they had were more important. And, you know, the Bible says in Matthew 6, y'all know the verses. The Bible says, you know, take no thought for tomorrow. You know, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know, we know that. So we are to trust him day by day. Each day we put our faith and trust in him. And it's not about planning for the future. You know, those things are wonderful and great. But he is first. He's number one. And the, the third, the excuse is that he, he's married a wife. And that brings to attention family. You know, what, do we put family above the Lord? And it, it seems like maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Family should come first, right? But, but even a, we could go down a few verses. Verse number 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters... Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And we know there, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, that he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. We know he is not teaching us to hate our family members, but rather what he's showing is that the importance of him in our life should should far exceed anybody else. And we think about the reasons for that, you know, I can't be the father or the husband that I should be to my family unless he is first. I can love them if I put them first, and I love my family. If I put them first, and I put my boys first, and they're number one in my heart, I cannot prepare them for their life in this world. It has to be that he's first. 
And that doesn't mean that I don't love them. I love them, but I have to put him first. Amen. Otherwise, I can't be what I need to be. And that's whether you're, you're a son or daughter, father, you know, wife, whatever it may be, he has to be first or you are not being everything you can to your family. And, you know, we, oftentimes, you know, we, we get in circumstances where it seems like, you know, you have to pick one or the other. You pick right or wrong. You pick the Lord or you chase after family or, or whatever the circumstance may be. But there's, you know, I, and I don't know everybody's situation here, but there's many parents that are brokenhearted. Their children have left, you know, and they left church and, and don't care about this book. But honestly, just like we talked about last week, the prodigal son, that father didn't chase him out to that pig pen. He stayed where he was, and, and your priority has to be church, has to be this book, has to be the Lord, because you cannot help them if they are first. This has to be first, and once it is, then you can be the help that you need to be to everybody else around you. But, but these three, they, they had these excuses. Let's continue reading. In, in verse number 21, so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And I draw your attention to that again. He came to, to his master and, and discussed his efforts, discussed what had happened. He, he talked to, to who he was answering to and who had given him orders. So I ask you again, how much time do you, do you spend praying to the Lord? Because he, he went and answered to his master. But we'll continue reading. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and maimed and the alt and blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled." So he said, you go out there and you compel them. And, and, you know, people have different views on these verses, but that, you know, what we do on visitation, those that come and gather with us, that's what we do. We go out and, and we, we want to try to give people encouragement to be here. But it's not to make ourselves feel good that we've done our duty. We're unprofitable servants, but we want to love people and show them that the Lord cares about them. But, but he said, go out and compel them to come in. And that's not just going door to door. That's in your everyday life. That's at your job. You know, do you show people that you care? I, you know, I've made so many mistakes in my life, but I know at my work, what I try to do, you know, the people that work for me, you know, I'm a supervisor there, and I try my best to let them know that I care. You know, I could be dogmatic about rules and you know, regulations and time off and all these different things, and I, I hold people accountable, but at the same time, they have to know that I care. I say that I'm a Christian. Amen. Otherwise, if I'm just going to have no emotion at all and not show any love to people, I might as well keep, keep my mouth shut and not say that I'm a Christian. Amen. I don't need to identify with him if I'm not going to love people. Amen. So it, it's not just you know, going out and, and you know, witnessing through door to door. It's your everyday life. You take every chance that you have to, to talk to somebody and share what he has done. Amen. You know, I, I don't know, jumping in my mind, I, my wife, she... I think she had posted something on Facebook about it, but um, they had went through Taco Bell. The, this was, I guess, maybe a month or two ago, and um, Andrew's sitting in the back, and, and he, he hollers up to her in the front, the guy had come to the window, and, and he says something like, you know, Mom, you need to invite him to church. And she's thinking, okay, okay, you know, whatever. And he, he keeps agging her on, keeps going, and he says, you need to tell him about Jesus. Right. And, and he says, those little things, you know, those little things from the church, you need to give him one of those and tell him about Jesus. And he keeps going, and, you know, eventually that's what she did. You know, that's all of us. You know, if we just had childlike faith where it was so simple, it's so simple, it's not even hard. You know, we can go to the grocery store, and, you know, I can start a conversation with anybody at the grocery store about sports, about the weather, about my allergies right now, about anything. I can talk about anything with any, anybody, you know, but... How can we say that we love him right. and we can't speak about him? Yes. The book says, you know, that master said, go out and compel people to come in. You cannot compel people. Times have changed. I'm going to be honest with you. You know, it used to be a, a day and age where, you know, people were sensitive to this book and you could go out and invite people and talk to them. You know, back in, in the middle of 1900s, 1950s, 60s, 
you know, 80s, and people were sensitive to the Bible, but now things have changed. You, people are not going to trust you. They're not going to trust you just off the bat. You have to show people that you care, right. that you love them. Otherwise, you will, you'll be of none effect as a Christian. You have to care about people. So you know, I, I've got people that I've worked with and, and folks that say they're a Christian, and they're just so mean. They're so cold. And you listen to their conversation, and it's like, man, that's my Savior that you're representing. Everybody knows that you identify as a Christian. Why would you talk to people that way? And it's even, I've even heard people argue with coworkers about the Lord, about how he is the creator. And that person was right in that argument. But the way they presented it was hateful. And there's nobody that was in that room that's going to listen to what they had to say. There was a Catholic in the room. There, was, there were several other people that don't believe this book in the room. And the mentality and the attitude that's presented makes everything that that person said of no effect. But we're to go out and compel. We're, we're to love people and show them that we care. And I, I know that's our pastor's heart. You know, he, he cares about people. And that, that's to be our job, too, because that's what the book says. Not, not just because of what he says. It's what this book says. But um, thinking about that, this man offered a gift that wasn't wasn't deserved, wasn't earned, there was nothing that, that, they, that they did that, that you know, told him I should do something in return to them, I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 19. So just a few pages over, John chapter 19, and I, I'm simply going to read here, and I just want to show you another gift that's been offered. It's not a supper. But we're going to start in John chapter 19, verse number 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. That should have been my head and that should have been your head. That crown should have been on our heads. And he took it and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They should have been hitting us with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Had that have been us, he would have found fault in us. We would have been deserved for what was taking place. All right, but he was standing there and he testified. He said, I don't find anything wrong in this man. Verse 5, then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, behold the man. When the chief priest therefore and officer saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. This is a man that did not know God, a man that did not have any concern whatsoever, but he could have easily just went along with the crowd, and he twice said, I find no fault in this person. And he continues on in, in, in verse number Let's see, verse number 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. You know why he was afraid? Because they said he was the Son of God. But had he have been able to find fault in him, he would have been content in his heart to send him to be crucified. But the life that Jesus lived and the words that he had spoken up to that point to Pilate, he was terrified at those words because in his heart of hearts, he thought maybe there is a chance that this is the Son of God. And he was fearful. And so they continue. Verse number 9. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto Unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. 
But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross that was ours, that's where we should have been. He he bore that cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. That gift is so much more than a supper. That gift is more than, than we could comprehend. Everything that he endured should have been on our backs. It should have, we should have bore the portion of our cup, as Psalm says. The portion of our cup results in fire and punishment, and he endured all those things for us. That free gift that he offered, you know, those excuses, we, we could stand here and we could talk about you know, all the people that, that reject him and their reasons, whether it be money, whether it be you know, another God that they worship, that they place higher than, than their creator. We could talk about all those things. And, you know, if I, if I stood up here and talked about, you know, alcoholics and, and homosexuals and, and all kind of different, you know, people out in the world that reject him, we would all in our hearts, you know, we, we'd agree, you know, how in the world could they reject him? Right. How could they reject, you know, all the proof that's out in the world? How could they, how could they ignore it? How could right. they just place it aside? But as I read this, something jumped out to me. And there's something missing in this story. And I don't say that as, as an attack on God's word. I say it as it's missing on purpose, I believe. And I, I look at this and, you know, all these people made an excuse for why they rejected the Lord or why they rejected this offer of this gift of the supper, just like people do in, in our time. But, and that's foolish. That, that's nonsense. But nobody in this story... And I've read it, you know, we read it together. Nobody in this story goes up to this man's door and knocks on that door and asks for, for a portion of that gift, a portion of that supper, and takes that, that food and walks away. There's nobody that was foolish enough to do that. But your average Christian, that's the way we treat the Lord. We, we go and, and we want the gift that he's offered but then we turn around and walk away once we have it. Come on. And, you know, we, we can look at all the lost people in the world and say, what in the world is wrong with y'all? Why can't you see the truth? But how can we say that we've accepted that gift and yet we have no communion with him? We have no fellowship with him. We, we live our lives day to day and place everything else at more important and give him no time at all, no effort at all, no sacrifice at all. We would be the same as somebody walking up to that man's door and turning around and walking away after they took the food. That's not, it's not even mentioned because it's not even comprehensible that somebody would do that. But that's the way we treat the Lord. And, you know, I, I thought about this, you know, we, we talked this morning about you know, a lot about the white throne judgment that's always on my heart and I, I apologize if I bore y'all but that just I don't know that, that when that day comes it's going to be so severe and and the consequences we're there's going to be so many regrets that we have and you know it just sticks in my heart and I, and I hope that doesn't bore y'all when I end up there you know every service that I get to preach but you know they're going to have their judgment they're going to have their place yeah but just like they're going to have that place and that time, so are we. We're going to have a time where we meet the Lord. And I'd invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Good. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and, and I'm not going to hold you all long tonight. We'll be, we'll be done shortly. But, you know, we could, we could look out at the lost world, and we, we could make ourselves feel better that we've accepted that free gift, and we're not foolish enough to, to ignore it. We could, we could feel that way about ourselves. But there, there's going to be a day where we meet him, and it's not going to be that we're better than them. He's going to take this book, and we're going to have to answer for it. Right. And we'll start in verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Right. Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 17, everybody knows this one. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. One of the greatest errors that is made is the insignificance that is given to our encounter with the Lord. And the reason that that is given such insignificance is because of the generalization, and rightly so, you know, for, for what people need as lost people, but the generalization of heaven and hell, those two things, that's all that matters. That's, that's what people believe is all that matters. And yes, if you're a lost person, that's all that matters, heaven or hell. But those two things and the generalization of, you know, those being what matters, it diminishes our view of that day that we stand before the Lord. And I'm not up here trying to tell you that, that heaven and hell, that those two things don't matter because they do. You know, we, we, we know in Mark chapter 9, we know what Jesus said. He said, you know, if your hand offends thee, cut it off. He said, if, you're, if your foot offends thee, cut it off. And he said, if your eye offends thee, pluck it out. That's severe. But he said, you would rather enter into life maimed or halt or with one eye than go to hell and spend eternity there. And, and then it says, Amen. I've always wondered, you know, there's some things we read in the Bible. We think, you know, we just read past them and maybe they don't make sense to us. And, and we get the general point of the verse and we go past it. And, and maybe, I, you know, I'm foolish for saying this. Y'all bear with me if it, if this seems silly to y'all, y'all just ignore it. But the Bible says, you know, at that place, it's going to be a place where, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Right. And everything's in this book for a reason. I thought, you know, I've always wondered, what does that mean, where the worm dieth not? What? I don't understand why that's there. What does that have anything to do with? And the other day I was walking into our apartment and I looked down on the sidewalk and it was one of those days where it was a little bit warmer and I looked down, and please forgive me if this seems silly, but, and I don't even know if this is what it's saying, but I, it was just a thought I had. But I looked down on the concrete, and there was worms scattered all over the concrete that had been burned up on the concrete. And I thought, that verse jumped out to me, and I thought, you know, he's saying where the worm dieth not. So that, the heat of that concrete caused the, those worms to die, but in hell, they're not going to be able to get out. There's going to be no escape. You know, there, there's nobody that's going to die there. It's going to be continual sorrow in the fire that is not quenched. And, and I don't know if that's what he's saying, but, you know, it just resonated with me that those, those worms, they died on that so sidewalk because it got too hot. But in hell, it's not going to be too hot that you can escape it. It's going to be everlasting. And it's going to be a, an eternity separated from Christ. And that, that's a sad condition. So I, I understand the importance of heaven and hell, but that, that day that it comes when we encounter God, the, the significance of that is so great. Yes. And, and the consequences of that encounter, heaven or hell, is very important. 
It's of extreme significance, but just as terrifying is the encounter itself. Right. Standing before him is going to be terrifying. And, and as we address that, if I could, if someone could come to the piano, we're, we're almost done. Just a very simple thought tonight. Good. Y'all turn to Revelation chapter number one. Amen. So Revelation chapter number one, this will come to be our stopping place. I want to read two verses to you. So chapter number one of the book of Revelation, verses 13 and 14. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. I want you to understand that after that, that does matter, but you're going to stand there, and his eyes are going to be as a flame of fire. And at that point, what we talked about this morning, those that stand at the white throne judgment, that's going to be bad, it's going to be awful, and we need to take precaution now. But when we stand before him ourselves, all that's going to be faded away. We're going to give an account for ourselves. There is nothing that Haynes Baptist Church, that, that, that this church can accomplish as a group that's going to answer for me right. individually. Y'all aren't going to stand there with me. And I'm not going to stand there with you. You're going to give an account. Your spouse is not going to stand there and Amen. say... Yeah, and take up for you and justify you. That's not going to happen. You're going to be by yourself, and his eyes are going to be as a flame of fire looking at you. And the basis of that judgment, we know in, in John 12, 48, the Bible says, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him, him in the last day. Yes. This book's going to be open. You're going to be judged by this book, Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words will not pass away. Amen. This is going to be your, your judge right here. Amen. And we're going to stand there. And that, that judgment, it's going to be, it's going to be complete. Yes, that examination that he gives us is going to be complete. Yes, and, you know, we're, we're going to give an answer. I, I jotted a few verses down. We, we won't go to them. I, I'll just reference them to you. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. We're, we're going to give an account for our thoughts. Amen. He knows what we think. Yes, sir. We imagine that we can go through life and we can come to church and look right and, and act right and sing and do all these things, but he knows what we think. That's right. you, you can't escape him. He's searching our hearts. He, he knows it. Then we're going to answer for our words. The Bible says in Matthew 12, 36, I, I believe the, the wording is, you know, we're going to be accountable for every idle word spoken. Amen. And, and I believe a few verses before that, I, I think that's where it's at. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I, I believe it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Those things that come out of our mouth, we're not going to be able to take those back. Right. So everything that we've ever said in anger that was wrong, we're going to give an account for that. Just as, you know, if we're trying, even if we have intentions of representing the Lord, but we do it out of pride, just, to, just as, you know, I'd mentioned earlier, a coworker before in my life has done that. You know, if we do those things out of pride and, and be hateful and angry towards people, we're going to give an account for that. Amen. Because that's damaging to the testimony of Amen. Christ. We're going to answer for those things. We're also going to answer for our deeds. Everything that we do. The things that we do outside these walls, you know, maybe it even goes past our thoughts. Maybe we even act on things. We're going to answer for that stuff. And nobody's going to be able to justify us. We're going to be standing there, his eyes as a flame of fire piercing through us. Right. And we're going to give an account for those things. Yes. And even after, after those three things, before we even get to works, those three things, you've got to be pure before you're even qualified to serve him. You know, those three things, we got to make sure we're clean. 
you know, I, I love coming to church here. And I, you know, I went to church last night at my uncle's church and, you know, the, the preacher there, he, he dealt with, you know, the issue of sin. You know, we hear that word and, you know, yes, we think it's wrong, but I don't think we comprehend how much it hinders the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not just floating around trying to make it in the doors of the church. He's living within us. If he's not here in our services, it's because we're responsible for that. All right, so those three things, our thoughts and, and our words and our deeds, if we're not clean and pure, God cannot meet with us. And, you know, we could have this whole side of the church, everybody over here be dedicated to the Lord, love the Lord, want to do right, have honest intentions of being humble and, and love others. And, and I'm not talking about y'all, but if this side of the church, you know, was the opposite and, you know, had, had things in their heart that were hindering the Spirit of God, we could all get together and God not meet with us. Right. You know, we are each responsible for ourselves, but when we meet together, you're responsible to everybody else as well. Right? I mean, I, I'm not making that up. That's what the Bible says. You know, He lives within us. He's not just floating around. And when the Bible says, you know, talking about the tribulation period, you know, it talks about when he that leadeth, you know, it's talking about the church. Right. The Spirit of God is taking out of the world. That's us. Right. We are taken out. He lives within us. So those three things, if we don't, if we don't take care of those and, and be accountable to God day to day, confessing to him and asking for forgiveness so that we can have his righteousness in our life. We're not even qualified to work for him. Amen. But then 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 and 15 y'all know those verses where you know it's tried by fire. Your works are, are tried and, and those things that weren't done in love they're going to be burned up. Amen. And those things that were done in pride they're going to be burned up. So you, you could make it all the way past you know your your thoughts and your deeds and your actions and, and your words and all these things and and you can make it through that, but if you get down to your works and you've got pride in your heart, it's going to be burned up. Amen. And the Bible says that person's going to be saved as by fire. You know, they're not going to be put in hell, but they're going to be saved. But you're still going to answer for those things to the Lord. You know, what, what will we have to show? What are we going to hold before him? You know, I've often thought, you know, how is that scenario going to play out? Just like the white throne judgment, what's going to happen, you know? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, he's going to be on his throne. He's going to be executing judgment. You know, I don't know if it'll be a single file line. I don't know how it'll play out. But if it were, I mean, yeah, we could think, you know, all those crazy, you know, contemporary Christians out in the world, I'll be lined up with them and I'll look good. You know, I, the, the Lord will think much of me. You know, and I, I don't know why... It's come to my mind, you know, I remember when, when me and my wife first started dating, you know, her, her family was living in just south of Greenville, South Carolina. And this doesn't have much to do with this. Y'all bear with me. But there, there's a, a church down there, and I, I say church loosely. There's a church down there, and they've got satellite campuses. And this man, everybody flocked to these places. And the satellite places... They would put up, you know, screens to show him from the main place. And this man, and I'm just telling you all the honest truth. So that, that church, you could walk in there and, and you would hear them play the rock band ACDC, Highway to Hell. You would hear them play that. You'd walk in and you, you'd hear all kind of worldly music and people flocked to it. You know why? Because they didn't have to answer to God. They didn't have to give an account to him. They don't, they don't want it to answer to him. They just want that God that approves of everything and lets you come to heaven. That's what they want. But, but that church, you know, I remember seeing something where they had a video on YouTube where they took thousands of teenagers down to the beach. And they went to baptize, you know, all the ones that have recently professed, you know, to know Christ. And they get down there and they... and. And they go to baptize them, and the video, all the boys don't have their shirts on. Right. They're not even hardly dressed. Yeah. The girls similar. Great. You know, I, I, I think about those things. You know, if any of those people, I don't know their hearts. I'm not condemning them. But if they're saved, you know, I'd like to think, 
Well, if I'm lined up with them at the judgment seat, you know, I'll be all right. You know, but there's also, you know, there, there was a man who, he left a place called Iconium and a place called Antioch, and he went to a place called Lystra. And there, and all he had done up to this point, he had spoke about the Bible. He would spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, go, he goes to Lystra, and the people from the previous two cities, they follow him there. Because it wasn't enough that they kicked him out. They followed him to Lystra, and, and they stoned him for trying to preach, preach Christ to people. And they, they stoned him there and left him for dead. And, you know, he, the people that were with him took him out of the city, and, you know, he, he regained a little bit of strength. But you know what he did? He went back to Antioch, and he went back to Iconium to confirm the people that he had already preached to. Those people, uh, there were citizens of those places that followed him there to kill him. Right. And he went back because he cared about the people yes, who had professed to know Christ. Yes, that was the Apostle Paul. What if I'm standing with him? Come on. What am I going to answer? What am I going to say? What am I going right. to do? Right. That devotion, I know we live in a different time. I know we've got distractions. We've got the internet. We've got the cell phone. We've got all these things, the television. But he had things in his life too. He had people walk away from him. He, he had, I mean, he, he had confrontation with Peter over the way Peter was behaving, you know, playing two sides. He had confrontation over that. He had things he dealt with. We're not excused. We don't have to go, go to another city and worry about being stoned. He did. He may not have, have had the television and the internet, but he had to deal with his life being threatened. We've got it easy compared to that. Yes, Nobody's stopping me and Aaron from going up the street and knocking on people's doors and telling them about Jesus. Nobody's stopping us. Amen. We can claim that, that this country is you know, coming down on Christianity. They don't want to hear what we have to say, but we still have the right to say it. Amen. And we want to cry and act like we're being persecuted. Right. How are we being persecuted? We get to meet tonight and read the Bible. That's right. you know, Amen. We just want an excuse to not do our jobs to serve the Lord. That's what it is. But, but I want y'all to think, you know, that day when those people stand before God at the white throne judgment, it's going to be awful. Yeah. I, I have no words that are adequate to describe it. But when we stand before him and his eyes are as a flame of fire and he's looking at us and he knows that we've had access to his perfect word, what are we going to answer? Good. What are we going to say? Amen. What are we going to have to present to him? as gratitude for, for him wearing our crown of thorns, Amen. carrying our cross while they, they spit on him and mocked him. What are we going to answer to him? Yes. Coming to church is not sufficient. And I know tonight's been more teaching than, you know, quote, unquote, preaching, but I want you to think about that. This Bible is perfect. It's pure. It's holy. Our Savior is righteous. He's Amen. perfect. Amen. That sacrifice was so much... Are we going to tell him that we came to church on Sunday night? That's our answer to, to what we've done for him? Come on. That don't make us better than the people that didn't show up tonight. Amen. It doesn't have anything to do with it. That's, they're gonna, they'll answer for that to God. You're not going to answer for it. Right. You're going to answer to God for, for your dedication yes, to him. Amen. All right, so as we approach the next week, tomorrow turns Monday. We go back to work. We have to wait till Wednesday to come to church. But let's think about what, how are we living our lives? Do we, do we ever even speak of him until Wednesday comes? That's good. Amen. You know, let's think about our service to him. Number one, are we even qualified for service? And number two, are we loving people the way that we should? All right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, be bad. It's going to be scary. You know, the, the after effects of that encounter is going to be awful, but seeing him face to face is going to be terrifying. Right knowing the things that I've done. Y'all don't know about them. He knows, though. Right. He knows the thoughts that I've had, that I didn't throw out, that I let linger there. He knows all those things. He knows the deeds that I've done that nobody knows about. And I'm going to give an account for that. Right. That's terrifying. But that'll be all of us. Let's stand. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. 
If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners, so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you would, you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.